Hi, welcome. My name is Penny Swindell, and I am the patient educator on our spine care unit here at St. Joseph's Hospital. Our spine surgeons perform over a thousand operations here at St. Joseph's Hospital, so this helps tell you that this is nothing that we are new to. You are in great hands, and we're going to take great care of you. Our spine care unit is staffed with some nationally certified orthopedic nurses, which tells you that we studied specifically on these conditions in order to meet your needs. Our goal is always to provide you with the best hospital experience possible, emphasizing quality, service, and safety. Recognized by groups like Blue Cross Blue Shield, our comprehensive program features hospital and physician expertise, our multidisciplinary staff is dedicated to providing you with excellent care and a foundation for a successful recovery. Dedicated hospital resources, dedicated OR space and team, dedicated spine care unit for consistency of care, and robust support from services like physical therapy. Patient-centered protocols, pre-op education, patient-focused clinical pathways, using evidence-based practice to provide safe, high-quality care and treatment and shared decision-making protocols. Focus on patient outcomes, function, prevention of infection, prevention of readmissions or reoperations, and we believe that our patients play a key role in assuring a successful recovery. Our goal is to involve our patients in their treatment through each step of their recovery. An established regional presence, patients that come from all across our areas to have their surgery here at St. Joseph's Hospital. And our magnet designation, St. Joseph's Candler is recognized by the American Nurses Credentialing Center after demonstrating excellence in patient care. The magnet recognition program provides the ultimate benchmark for patients and their family to measure the quality of care they can expect at our hospital. When you're here with us, we're going to provide you a team approach to guide you through your surgery and your recovery phase. You're going to meet up with several members of our spine care team. Number one, you are the most important member of that team. You are the quarterback. You are the one calling the shots. Your surgeon, any of his assistants, our hospitalists, which are hospital-based medical doctors that might follow your care while you're with us. The anesthesiologist that puts you to sleep and manages your pain during your surgery. Register nurses. Once you arrive on the spine care unit, you will be assigned to a primary care nurse. A charge nurse will help direct your care, and a nurse manager oversees the spine care unit. Patient care technicians, under the direct supervision of a registered nurse, a PCT will assist with your care. Our skilled physical therapists provide training and exercises to regain your functional mobility. Our discharge planners continuously review your progress and communicate with your surgeon and insurance company as necessary. And our pastoral care services provide spiritual counseling and support to our patients and their families. Goals for today's class is to provide you with the information needed to help you feel prepared for your surgery. Help to reduce your anxiety by sharing what you can expect. Increase your safety so you secure the best possible results after your surgery and help answer any questions that you might have. It's important for you to understand how your spine functions so you can protect it before and after surgery. A healthy spine shelters your spinal cord while allowing you to move. Our spine is composed of 24 bones called vertebrae. The vertebrae are separated by a shock absorber called a disc and flexible joints that slide and allow movement. Neck and back pain can be caused by a number of factors, including injury, infection, tumor, deformity, arthritis, or stenosis. A normal disc serves as a shock absorber. A disc has a jelly-like center and a tough fibrous outer ridge. Degenerative disc. As we age, there's a loss of fluid in the discs. This reduces the ability of the disc to act as a shock absorber and it makes them less flexible. A bulging disc is when the disc bulges outside of the space it normally occupies, but it does not rupture. Bulging discs only become serious when they bulge enough to cause narrowing of the spinal canal. 
Usually, symptoms of a bulging disc can be managed with conservative treatment, such as physical therapy and medication. When symptoms are steadily getting worse, surgery may likely be suggested. A herniated disc occurs when some of the softer jelly pushes out through a crack in the tough outer exterior of the disc. A herniated disc can irritate nearby nerves and result in pain, numbness, or weakness in an arm or leg. Most people cannot pinpoint the exact cause of the herniated disc. Sometimes using your back muscles instead of the thigh muscles when you're lifting large heavy objects or by twisting while lifting. A thinning disc, when there's loss of fluid as we age, it makes our discs thinner and narrows the distance between the vertebrae. As that space between the vertebrae gets smaller, there's less padding between them and the space becomes less stable. The body reacts to this by constructing bony growths called osteophytes or bone spurs. Bone spurs put pressure on our spinal nerves or the spinal cord, resulting in pain. There are several different types of spinal surgery. Basically, spine surgery is used to relieve pressure on the spinal nerves or the spinal cord. Spine surgery is used to provide stability to an area of the spine that is painful, fractured, or has too much motion. And spine surgery can help correct a spinal deformity such as scoliosis, lordosis, kyphosis. Two of the most frequently performed spine surgeries, um, the first one on the left, lumbar laminectomy. And this picture is showing the section of bone that they remove. Basically, they're opening up a window to open up that spinal canal so there's no more pressure on the nerves, no pressure on the spinal cord itself. And then the, on the right is a picture demonstrating a foraminotomy, and it's just a different section where they can go in with tiny instruments and opening up windows to free up the space and a discectomy, and that's when they go in with little instruments and they can remove the disc that's bothersome. Spinal fusion, if your doctor performs a spinal fusion, this is when they join two or more vertebrae together permanently, so there's no more motion between the vertebrae, there's no more slippage. Spinal fusions can be done using bone from your hip, a bone substitute, or by using screws and rods, and your doctor will choose the best method for you. There are various approaches when it comes to spinal fusion. A posterior cervical incision, where the incision will be at the back of your neck. Posterior lumbar incision, your incision will be on your lower back. An anterior cervical incision will be to the side of your neck, and an anterior lumbar incision will be on your side. Materials used can also vary greatly. Here's a list of some of the things that our doctors can use to fuse your spine. Of course, your surgeon will choose the best materials based on your condition. Let's talk about some of the benefits of spine surgery. The primary reason for most back surgery is to get relief from back pain. Reducing pain can offer many additional benefits. Of course, increased activity, better physical fitness, improved mood because you're not suffering in pain any longer, less need for pain medicines with fewer side effects, the ability to get back to work, and increased productivity at work. There are also some risks involved with spine surgery. Overwhelmingly, the majority of the patients who undergo back surgery have no complications during or after surgery. All surgeries, though, carry some degree of risk. Part of today's goal is to work together to make sure you know what to expect along the way, minimizing your personal risks. This section is all about preparing you for surgery. First off, preoperative self-care. Practice good sleeping habits. I know that's hard to think about when your surgery is in the next few days or weeks, but it is important that you can get a good night's sleep for your body to mend after surgery. A lot of my patients go ahead and take care of their dental work now rather than waiting until after their surgery. It's always important to see that primary care physician. Make sure they think you're good and healthy, ready for your operation. Make sure that you're on all the medications that you need to be on right now. I know it's really important for you to hear this, 
but it is very important that you stop smoking prior to surgery. Smoking inhibits bone health and growth. Nicotine decreases your body's blood circulation, making it harder for the oxygen to get to various parts of your body. Patients that smoke experience more post-op pain than our non-smokers do. It's important for you to start planning now for your discharge before you even arrive at the hospital. The most important thing is you need to identify a caregiver, somebody that can be with you around the clock for those first few days after we send you home. Special considerations need to be made for your children and or your pets. You'll need someone that can drive you home because you can't drive just yet. It's important to know your health care benefits, out-of-pocket expenses, and you might need some assisted devices for safety at home, such as a walker or a cane. And if you do not have those devices already, the hospital will order it for you and it will be available for you before we discharge you home. Some additional home safety guidelines. You might want to set up a home recovery zone, somewhere where you're going to hang out in the daytime. We need to know you can get in and out of bedrooms and bathrooms safely. In your home recovery zone, you might want a little basket with remote controls, reading glasses, tissues, cordless phones, hobby items, things that you will need close by. We want to get rid of obstacles that could trip you and cause a potential fall. So pick up scatter rugs, remove any clutter that might be on the floors, tape down electrical cords that could get in your way, install handrails on staircases where you don't have them. Sometimes my patients will prepare food ahead of time. They'll cook larger portions leading up to surgery and freeze plates, things that are easy to take out and reheat. Um, if family and friends offer, let them, or you might want to stockpile foods that are easy to reheat. Okay, let's talk about your pre-op visit. What to expect when you come in to be pre-opt. Your nurse is going to review with you your medical history. They're going to get a list of your home medications and allergies. They're going to do any routine blood and urine tests that your physician might need. And you may or may not need a chest x-ray and an EKG. Depends upon if you've had one in the recent past and whether or not your surgeon requires that. What to bring with you on your pre-op visit, please bring all your home medications, including any herbal supplements. It's helpful to bring them in their original bottles so that the nurse can confirm your doses and frequency. Bring a list of your pertinent medical history and any known allergies. Bring a list of your previous surgeries and procedures. And most importantly, please bring a copy of your advanced directive, living will, durable power of attorney. Um, hand it off to your nurse and we will put it in your chart so your doctors know all of your wishes. All right, I'm going to pack my suitcase, the things to bring to the hospital. What am I going to bring with me? Bring any personal care items, any hygiene items you might need while you're with us. We just have very limited supplies if you forget things at home. Toothbrushes, toothpaste, denture cups, that's about the extent of our supplies. As part of physical therapy, you will be walking out in the hallways. Some people are more comfortable if they have shoes on their feet. If you want to wear shoes, therapy wants something flat with a non-skid bottom and a back that wraps around your heel. Therapy does not like anything you just slide your toes into, like scuffy slippers, mules, crocs, flip-flops, because your feet can slip and you can hurt yourself. Sneakers are best, sandals with a heel strap, or we even give you the footies with the traction treads on the bottom. Most of my patients just stay in the footies. However, you will be most comfortable. You'll want to set a loose, comfortable clothes for going home. Bring your important telephone numbers. Sometimes the pain medicine can leave you a little foggy and you can't remember those important numbers. And please leave all jewelry and other valuables such as large amounts of cash, credit cards, checkbooks. Leave all that at the house where it is most safe. All right, we've worked our way up to the night before your surgery. That afternoon between 3 and 5 o'clock is when you'll get your telephone call telling you exactly what time to report to the hospital. For surgeries taking place on a Monday, 
and they make those calls between 3 and 5 on Friday. So you're going to take any medicine as instructed by your physician. You're going to take your shower that evening, dress in clean pajamas, and put clean fresh sheets on your bed. For ladies, please remove all nail polish. You're going to scrub your surgical site with antimicrobial cloths as instructed, and we're going to show you how to do that coming up. Nothing to eat or drink after midnight, including smokeless tobacco, gum, hard candy, breath mints, ice chips. What to expect the day of your surgery. When you arrive at the hospital, you're going to park in parking lot C by the emergency room, and you're going to sign in at the patient registration desk. After registration, you and your family members will be escorted to day surgery where a nurse is going to get you ready for surgery. They're going to take your vital signs, start an IV, and they might give you a sedative to help you relax if you're anxious that morning. You will meet with the anesthesiologist while you're in day surgery. Anesthesia is going to review your medical record, talk to you about any previous experiences you may have had with anesthesia, and they're going to determine and discuss with you the best anesthesia plan for you. They're also going to talk with you about pain control during your surgery. The OR team involved in your care specializes in spine cases. For your safety, your surgeon will lead a timeout to review your procedure one last time as a team. Your surgical site will be marked and double checked in the operating room just prior to beginning your procedure. The length of your surgery will depend on the specifics of your procedure. After your surgery is completed, you'll be taken to the recovery room. You will stay down in recovery a good one to two hours until you come upstairs to your room. When you're in recovery room, you will be given oxygen and you will frequently be encouraged to take some big deep breaths and cough. Your vital signs will be closely monitored and you will receive pain medicine. They won't give you anything to eat or drink in recovery, but they will offer you some ice chips when you're fully awake and you might have a tube in place to drain fluid from your operative area. What to expect during your hospital stay? 
Once you are stable, you will be moved to the spine care unit. There, our entire care team will be focused on managing your pain, keeping you safe, reducing your risk of complications, helping you regain your strength, and preparing you for discharge. Typical length of stay varies and depends upon a number of factors specific to you. Managing your post-op pain. You're having surgery. You're going to experience pain, but our team's goal is to make you feel as comfortable as possible. Frequently in your stay, you're going to be asked to rate your pain on a scale of zero to 10. Zero, no pain whatsoever. 10 is the worst pain imaginable. Zero pain is not typical following surgery, not a realistic goal to have. What our goal is, is to maintain your pain level at a six or less. This will enable you to sleep, eat, and perform your other desired activities. Your surgeon will determine the best combination of medicine to manage your individual pain. Your plan will include one or more of the following, intravenous or intramuscular pain medicines, oral pain medicines, and muscle relaxers. And we can do with some additional pain management measures. We can distract you by watching your favorite TV program, maybe listening to some soothing music. We can put some ice to the operative area to make it feel better. We can do some meditation and deep breathing exercises. One of the main things we wanna do while you're with us is prevent any post-op complications. To prevent blood clot formation, we're going to fit you in a pair of white elastic TED stockings and some SCD sleeves. The SCDs are cuffs that wrap around your calves that inflate with air. Every time they're inflating, it's bringing the blood back up through your system so it doesn't sit in your legs and turn into clots. We're also gonna get you up and get you moving right away. That'll prevent blood clot formation. We wanna prevent post-op pneumonia. So we're gonna give you a little breathing machine and there will be a video clip demonstrating how to use the incentive spirometer. We're gonna encourage you to cough and take some big deep breaths and we're gonna get you up and get you walking. That prevents pneumonia as well. We wanna prevent infection to your surgical site. Pre-op skin preparation is one of our first steps in preventing infection. That's why we have you shower and prep the night before surgery. We're going to prep your skin again immediately before surgery to make sure your skin is as clean as possible before surgery begins. We can give you some IV antibiotics to prevent infection. They give the first antibiotic before they make the first surgical incision and we can repeat them just till the morning after. You're gonna see your healthcare providers washing their hands with soap and water or hitting the hand sanitizer as they enter and exit out of your room. All right, Mrs. Mildred, we're gonna go over your incentive spirometer. Um, this device will help you keep your lungs active and clear since you've recently had surgery. Um, you're already sitting upright, so that's great. If you were in the bed, we would wanna make sure you were sitting as upright as possible as well. Um, before you place your mouth on the mouthpiece, we want you to exhale to clear the air out of your lungs like you'd be blowing on birthday candles. And then once you've exhaled, you can place your mouth around the mouthpiece and begin inhaling slowly and deeply. Um, we're gonna to wanna to make sure that this ball stays between these arrows I and mean, the this will rise up too as you inhale. Um, you will continue to do that for as long as possible. Once you don't feel like you can inhale any longer, you'll hold your breath for three to five seconds. Um, you can take this out of your mouth and then exhale slowly. Um, we want you to do this 10 times an hour. Um, we won't wake you during the night, but we do want you to um, have a goal to use this 10 times an hour to keep those lungs active and try to prevent you from um, developing any pneumonia. Okay. Okay, Do you feel comfortable it. doing a return demonstration for me? <clears throat> there you go. Inhale slowly and deeply. Okay. 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 We're gonna hold your breath for three to five seconds, and then you can exhale. Very good. Did it move? It did. <laughs> okay. 
What can you do to help prevent infection? Please make sure your surgeon knows if you've got any medical problems, especially if you're a diabetic, any skin problems like eczema or psoriasis, or if you have a current open sore on your body. Make sure your surgeon knows if you've ever had MRSA or one of our superbugs or an infection that was very difficult to treat with an IV antibiotic. Please don't smoke. Our patients that smoke do experience more post-op infections than our non-smokers do. We don't want to shave near the area where we're having surgery for at least three days so we're not making any possible cuts in our skin. Family and friends at visit should not be touching your dressing, touching your incision. Ask your visitors to hit the hand sanitizer or wash their hands when they come in to see you. And please avoid contact with anybody who's sick or anybody who has an active infection until you're completely healed up. We want to prevent post-op nausea, so your first meal after surgery will be liquids. Once you've held down your liquids and you're not feeling sick on your stomach, then we'll let you have whatever your heart desires. We do like to take things slow in baby steps because it's no fun to be sick after surgery. By all means, if you are feeling sick, we're going to give you some medicine to help out. We want to prevent you from having a fall, so please always use your call bell and ask for assistance before getting out of bed. Constipation can be a bad problem for my patients. Sometimes just from being put to sleep, your belly is the last thing that wants to wake up. It's moving slow and we're giving you a bunch of pain medicine. Biggest side effect of all pain medicine is constipation. So we're going to give you stool softeners while you're with us. We can give you a laxative if you're feeling miserable. We're gonna get you up and get you walking. That prevents constipation. We're going to encourage you to drink at least six, eight ounce glasses of water every day. We're going to encourage you to eat several servings of fresh fruits and vegetables. What to expect from your nursing team? We are your doctor's eyes and ears. We're with you 24 seven where he can't be. If you have any questions, any problems, by all means, we'll get him on the telephone or bring him back up here to see you. We're going to monitor your vital signs. We're gonna keep track of everything that goes in you to make sure it comes back out of you. We're gonna monitor your dressing and drain. We're gonna help get you up out of bed. We're going to constantly assess and control your pain. We're gonna help you with your hygiene, make you more comfortable, and it will be a continuous patient family education from today until the day we discharge you home. Physical therapy is going to see you while you're on the spine care unit. Physical therapy typically begins the same day as your surgery. As long as you're up to the room by three o'clock in the afternoon, your physical therapist will see you that same day. Physical therapy, of course, is an extremely important part of your rehabilitation and does require your full participation for an optimal outcome after surgery. Active participation in therapy will help get you home quicker. Goals of therapy are to prevent complications associated with stiffness and return you to your normal activities of daily living. During your physical therapy sessions, your therapist is going to evaluate your condition. They're going to come get you up out of bed, take you for a walk, teach you some exercises that you'll need to know to go home with. If your doctor has ordered you a back brace, by all means, they're gonna show you how to put that brace on and they're gonna instruct you on how to wear it, when you should wear it. They're gonna teach you how to roll in the bed like a log so you don't put any pressure on your spine and they're gonna teach you no BLTs. And here that doesn't mean a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. Here that means no bending, no lifting, and no twisting. Hey, Ms. Taylor. Good morning. How are you today? I'm good. My name is Andrew. I'm going to be your physical therapist today. Your surgeon had asked me to stop by to go over some things with you after you've had your back surgery. Okay. First thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to go over a list of do's and don'ts that you want to keep in mind after you, get, after you leave the hospital. Okay. okay. There's three main things that you want to avoid after having your back surgery. The first is no bending at your waist. So if you ever have to pick something up off the ground, you have to bend down onto one knee and mm -hmm. pick that object up. Keep your back as straight as possible. You want to avoid lifting any objects over five to 10 pounds. A good example would be a full gallon of milk, which weighs seven to eight. 
So try to use it as a guideline, don't lift anything over that. Okay. The last one would be no twisting. So if you have to move something from one area to another, you have to pick the object up, take some steps, and then put it back down. You never want to pick it up and twist. Okay. So avoid that twisting motion. A couple other things are the best exercise after you have had back surgery would be walking. So you want to try to walk two to three times a day. Start off about a five minute walk, which is what we're going to take in a minute here in the hallway, and build your way up to about a 15 minute walk. If you add a minute every other day from five and build your way to 15, that's about good enough. You don't have to go anything higher than that. Okay. Two other things I'm going to tell you are when you're sleeping at night, if you sleep on your back, you could put a pillow underneath your knees to relieve some pressure on your spine. If you're a side sleeper, you could put a pillow in between your legs to try to keep everything in alignment to avoid any kind of twisting motion in your back. The other thing is I tell all the patients is use common sense after you've had back surgery. If you think something's really going to hurt your back, it probably will, so just try to avoid that okay. activity. Okay. Now we're going to go into how to get in and out of the bed. It's called log rolling, and I'm going to try to take you through, and I'll talk you through and help you as needed, okay? So the first thing I need you to do is to try to bend both of your knees for me. Together? Yep, or? try to bring them up together at the same time. Very good. Nice and slow. Excellent. When you get to about 90 degrees at your knee joint, you can stop. Very good. Okay. Now you're going to take your left hand, and you're going to try to reach for the side of the bed over here and roll together as one onto your side. At Keep your back time. nice and straight, okay? Same time. Yes, same time. Roll with your legs and your upper body all at the same time. Come on over for me. Very good. Once you get onto your side, now you're going to kick your legs off the edge of the bed and you're going to push yourself up with your arms. Ready? Push. Push yourself up with your arms. Very good. Excellent. Now you can try to scoot, scoot forward and get your feet flat on the floor for me. Very good. I'm gonna try to put, I'm gonna put this belt around your waist just in case you lose your balance on our walk. How does that feel? Feels good. All right. So to stand up now, the correct way to stand up after you've had back surgery would be to push from the bed with your hands, keeping your spine nice and straight, and stand straight up for me. On the count of three, one, two, three, stand up for me. Excellent. Let's get your balance here before we go for our walk. Okay. All right. Nice and slow, we're going to head out the door here. Good, excellent. Let's go to the right down towards the hall, end of the hall here. All right. Well, you made it all the way back to the room, so you did an excellent job there. Okay. And we're going to go and turn and take a seat back on the edge of that bed. Try to sit more towards the top of the bed so we can get back lying in the correct position. Very good. A little bit more, one step up. Good. And you can go ahead and reach back for the bed with your hands. And slowly lower yourself down. Keep your spine nice and straight for me. And you can go ahead and sit. Very good. All right. Now, before we sit down, I'm going to take this belt. Before you lie back down, I'm going to take this belt off of you. Very good. All right. To lie back in the bed, it's the exact opposite as how you got out of the bed. So you want to try to scoot your hips back on the bed for me. Excellent. And then you're going to slowly start to go down onto your right elbow. When you start to go down to your right elbow, bring your legs up at the same time. Good. Try to get back onto your side before you roll onto your back. Good. Bring your legs up. Excellent. One there, one there. And now that you're on your side, you can roll onto your back for me. Very good. Yeah. Okay. All right, so that's how you want to get back into the bed. It's a good idea to continue to do that for a prolonged period of time. You don't want to call it's the easiest way on your spine, and you want to, like I said, you want to avoid that bending motion, so you always want to get in and out of the bed by rolling. Okay. Okay? All right. So I'm going to let your nurse know that you've passed your physical therapy test.
and that you're safe to go home per your doctor's orders. Do you have any questions for me before I leave? Uh, no, I don't think no? so. I'll right. get a printout, right? Yes, you will. Everything. Your nurse will give you all that handout when you get your discharge paperwork before you leave. Okay, well, okay. thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for choosing us for your health care, and I'll take you take care now. Okay. Your home recovery begins while you're still right here in the hospital with us. So before we let you go home, we're going to make sure you understand how to take all the medicine your doctors have prescribed for you. We can set up that first follow-up appointment with your surgeon if you don't have it already. We're going to review with you warning signs of infections and blood clots and help you understand what to do in the event of any of those signs. And by all means, we're going to make sure our staff has answered all of your questions before we let you go home. Your home recovery can take anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. Totally depends upon how you do after surgery. Some of the things to expect after discharge. As I mentioned, home recovery can last months and it will involve regularly scheduled visits to your surgeon to monitor your progress. Your first post-op visit is, is typically scheduled two to three weeks after your surgery. The following chart can help you know what to expect related to pain management, diet, activity, incision care, driving, and returning to work. Post-op pain is to be expected, and this should improve with each day. Take your pain medicine as prescribed. Please don't ever increase your dose unless you have the authorization of your surgeon. You might need to take a stool softener to prevent constipation from your pain medicine. And it is normal to experience muscle spasms after this type of surgery, and your surgeon can order you a muscle relaxer to take care of that. After we send you home, you're going to go right back on the diet that you're used to. But we do want to increase our fluids and fiber consumption to prevent constipation. You're not going to be allowed to lift for the first two weeks and physical therapy is going to instruct you on exactly how many pounds you were allowed to lift in those two weeks. Daily, we want to gradually increase the distance that we walk in order to help in our recovery and preventing constipation. Always remember those BLTs, no bending, no lifting, no twisting. When we send you home, we're going to provide you with specific instructions on how to care for your incision. You may shower as your doctor advises. You don't want to soak that incision in a bathtub, hot tub, swimming pool until it's completely healed up, until you have the okay from your surgeon. No driving until your doctor advises you that you can. Typically, your surgeon will release you at two weeks, allowing you to drive again. For patients having low back surgery, you want to avoid prolonged sitting on hard surfaces and long rides in the car. And please, no returning to work until you've been released by your surgeon. Please consult with your surgeon before resuming any other physical activities. And these are our warning signs. Warning signs of infection will be any fever over 101, persistent redness, drainage from the incision, the incision itself might open, you would have an increase in pain, and or localized tenderness and swelling. If you experience signs of infection, please notify your surgeon's office right away. If he can't see you, they're going to fit you in to see a partner, a PA, or a nurse practitioner. So somebody that can look at you, somebody can prescribe you the appropriate antibiotics. Warning signs of a DVT or a deep vein thrombosis. That's a blood clot in the leg is an increased pain in your calf or thigh, tenderness or redness of your lower extremities, increased swelling in your calf, ankle, or foot that does not go away after you've rested, you've elevated your legs. If you experience those signs, please call your surgeon's office right away. If it's after five o'clock in the evening, it's a weekend, a holiday, the answering service is kicked in, you need to tell that answering service you need to speak to a human being. You need advice of what to do next. Please do not put it off till Monday morning. And warning signs of a PE or a pulmonary embolus. That's a blood clot that has broken loose and migrated into your lungs. Is a sudden increased shortness of breath, sudden onset of chest pain, localized chest pain with coughing, 
You might even cough up blood. With a pulmonary embolus, I'm fine one minute, next minute I can't breathe. It feels like an elephant has parked himself in the middle of my chest. He's taken away every last bit of my air. My chest is killing me and I'm coughing my head off. If you experience those signs, somebody needs to pick up a phone, call 911 and get you to the closest medical facility. You need emergency attention. You need it right now. Thank you for choosing to be part of the St. Joseph's Candler Spine Care Team. If you have any questions at all, please call the Care Call Center. Thank you.